In the previous installment of this video series, we saw that following an initial wave of UFO reports in 1947, the Air Force began their UFO investigations with Project Sign, which evolved into Project Grudge, and finally into Project Blue Book. From its inception, the Air Force flying saucer investigations were internally divided on what the UFOs were. Despite this, for the public, the UFO issue was downplayed and the Air Force relied on deceit and stigma to minimize UFO reports. Then, in 1952, there was an increase in UFO reports nationwide, and there was a dramatic two-weekend UFO wave over Washington, D.C., which caused a surge of media coverage. In Washington, ghost-like objects dart across the radar screen at the CAA Traffic Control Center at National Airport for several hours. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. The UFO issue is now too big to ignore. And at the request of President Truman, the CIA convened the Robertson Panel. The Robertson Panel was a CIA-led panel of scientists that was to address the UFO issue. The panel concluded that the reporting of UFOs and the public's interest in UFOs were a threat to national security. The rationale was that the Soviet Union could manipulate flying saucer interest into a weapon of attack in the Cold War. The panel report stated that the national security agencies take immediate steps to strip the unidentified flying objects of the special status they have been given and the aura of mystery they have unfortunately acquired. And this led to UFO policy changes, like Gen App 146, which made the public reporting of UFO incidents a federal crime with the Espionage Act, and now military or commercial pilot testimony would not be reported. Air Force Regulation 200-2, which mandated that only positively identified cases were to be shared with the press. There was an increase in the use of trusted scientists, like Dr. J. Allen Hynek and Dr. Donald Menzel, to reinforce the Air Force claims that there was nothing to UFOs. There was an adaption of a lax policy when dealing with UFO hoaxers that allowed them free reign. And we saw the introduction of measures that would obfuscate UFOs. There was the introduction of the Avro car to the media, with the implication that many future UFO sightings were probably this experimental aircraft and we covered circumstantial evidence that the rise of coverage of contactees like George Adamski and the creation of the National Enquirer tabloid were part of the anti-UFO PSYOP. The Robertson panel also recommended that a coordinated propaganda campaign be undertaken to demystify UFOs, stating, The panel's concept of a broad educational program integrating efforts of all concerned agencies is that it should have two major aims, training and debunking. The debunking aim would result in reduction in public interest in flying saucers, which today evokes a strong psychological reaction. This education could be accomplished by mass media such as television, motion pictures, and popular articles. Basis of such education would be actual case histories, which had been puzzling at first, but later explained. And following the Robertson panel, Captain Edward J. Rupeld and the pro-UFO crowd of Project Blue Book were replaced with Air Force officers that would tow the debunking line. Project Blue Book was transformed from an official UFO study into a debunking PR firm. And this is where we will continue for this video. Project Blue Book is a shadow of its former self. We will now see how the recommendations of the CIA's Robertson panel and the anti-UFO PSYOP were instilled into the minds of millions of Americans. First, by examining traditional print media, and then by looking at how the anti-UFO PSYOP would find its way into the newest craze sweeping the nation. If you have a television set, it's very simple. The threat of the Soviet Union harnessing the public's interest in UFOs was used as a justification to manipulate, censor, and obfuscate media in what is supposed to be a free country with free expression, all in order to demystify UFOs amongst the American public and which cultivated a culture of stigma and ridicule which was deleted. This was crossed off, and I was told that I couldn't say it on the air. We are not hiding anything. We have nothing to hide. The flying saucer cultists would have us believe. Because every single page got rewritten, 
and rewritten. You nut, you fanatic, and all that. What would you think? The Air Force investigator believes they were illusions created by marsh gas. Along with the references mentioned previously, this video also references the Journal of UFO History series by Richard Hall, UFOs in Government, A Historical Inquiry by Michael D. Swords and Robert Powell, a survey of press coverage of unidentified flying objects from 1947 to 1966, Herbert Strentz, The Close Encounters Man, How One Man Made the World Believe in UFOs by Mark O'Connell. These and other reference documents are linked in the description. Keep in mind that we will cover a lot of names and dates that will be covered in more depth in later videos, but for now we are concerned with how the public's perceptions of UFOs were influenced. According to AIPO polls taken for every year during the 1950s, about 80% of Americans would read the newspaper daily. And during this time, the New York Times was one of the most popular newspapers in America, being carried in every state and every major city. The influence and power of the New York Times cannot be understated. The New York Times would receive local stories from all over the country and decide what to cover, deciding what was to become a national story. The ability to choose what is and isn't a national story is a huge tool, giving them the ability to shape public perceptions of reality and, in turn, public opinion. And the New York Times bestseller list gave the Times extra authority in reviewing all books. During this time, the New York Times and the CIA had a close relationship. CIA director Alan Dulles and New York Times editor Arthur Hayes Sulzberger were close friends, and Arthur Hayes Sulzberger signed an agreement with the CIA vowing to keep their collaborations secret. Another connection can be found in that Air Force debunker Dr. Donald Menzel was close personal friends with New York Times columnist Jonathan Leonard, and Menzel stated that Jonathan Leonard supported him completely. Now, with all of this in mind, let's examine New York Times UFO coverage during the 1950s and witness the impact the CIA's Robertson panel had in 1953. This bar graph represents New York Times UFO news stories for every year of the 1950s. The green articles represent UFO stories that have a positive or neutral stance, where the UFO witnesses are simply quoted and not disparaged. Like this story, More Flying Saucers in the Mediterranean, Orient, which recounts two separate UFO sightings from Lebanese pilots. Their accounts are listed without ridicule. In a 1950, there were seven positive UFO stories. Red represents flying saucer stories that come from a debunking and stigmatizing stance, and that repeat the Air Force's official narrative. Like this story, Saucer Balloons Fly, which states that UFOs reported near Holloman Air Force Base were balloons. Continuing through the years, we can see the following. In 1951, there are five positive UFO stories and four negative UFO stories. In 1952, the year of the giant UFO wave in DC flyover, there were 19 positive UFO stories and 15 negative UFO stories. Each year of the early 1950s, there were more positive UFO stories than negative. Then, in 1953, the year of the Robertson panel, we see something interesting. In January of 1953, there were three positive UFO stories. Then, the CIA's Robertson panel met and made their recommendations in late January stating that the public's interest in UFOs were a national security threat that needed to be quelled. And following the Robertson panel, the first UFO story in the New York Times was an article reviewing the new UFO debunking book by Harvard astronomer Dr. Donald Menzel. Inciting Menzel, Times wrote that those interested in flying saucers were amusing and pathetic. And the rest of 1953 saw more negative UFO stories than positive for the first time. Among these negative articles was an article by Dr. Donald Menzel's friend, Jonathan Leonard, reviewing Donald Kehoe's new book, Flying Saucers from Outer Space. Kehoe is largely seen as the biggest threat to the Air Force narrative, 
and he was one of the first to accuse the Air Force of an active cover-up regarding UFOs. In the Times article about his book diminished Kehoe and his research, as well as UFO enthusiasts. And following the Robertson panel, Jonathan Leonard would take over reviewing most flying saucer books. The flying saucer cultists are doing the same thing. To explain a few puzzling reports, they are dreaming up spaceships. 1953 also saw the first articles in the New York Times about the Avro car, represented by the yellow bar. The Avro car was the experimental air vehicle introduced by the Air Force as a means to obfuscate UFO reports. And 1953 also saw the first stories in the New York Times about George Adamski and the contactee movement, represented by the purple bar. And Donald Kehoe's books would often be featured alongside Adamski's. This angered Kehoe, who thought that Adamski and the contactees were polluting the field. And here is the data for the remaining years of the 1950s. We can see that prior to the Robertson panel, the New York Times would cover UFO stories that represented the Air Force official stance of hoaxes and misidentifications, and would cover stories that questioned it. And in the years prior to the Robertson panel, the New York Times covered more positive UFO stories than negative. In the years following the Robertson panel, we see a sharp decrease in UFO coverage overall, due in part to Air Force Regulation 200-2 and JANAP 146. And following the Robertson panel, when UFOs would be covered, the New York Times would mainly represent the Air Force's point of view, promote debunkers, trash talk UFO books, and obfuscate the situation by promoting George Adamski and the Avro car. It would be decades before the New York Times ran more positive news stories than negative in a given year. In 1970, Herb Stentz would release his study, A Survey of Press Coverage of Unidentified Flying Objects, 1947-1966. This was one of the first academic papers to cover UFOs. Herb Stentz would analyze UFO newspaper coverage between 1947 and 1966, and he also sent polling questionnaires to hundreds of newspapers. His research had some interesting conclusions. He highlights the local nature of coverage, stating, The coverage consisted primarily of items which were printed in one newspaper, usually one of low circulation, and provided the reader with a conversation topic a little information. He also highlights the press's nature to fully trust the Air Force about their UFO program. The Air Force UFO inquiry from 1947 through 1966 generally had been depicted in the press as thorough, scientific, and meriting public confidence. This study concluded that the Air Force UFO inquiry generally exhibited none of these characteristics. The press should recognize that Air Force statements and statistics on the percentage of explained UFO reports are of dubious value, for the reasons given in Chapter 5 and 6. The press should be more critical of the Air Force UFO inquiry, as that inquiry currently exists. And Herb Strand's research would also highlight the ridicule factor, stating, The high degree of ridicule present in the UFO phenomena was reflected in the press coverage, and much of the ridicule resulted from failure to distinguish between nonsensical flying saucer stories and the few reports which merited study. And this ridicule found in UFO press coverage would even extend to UFO whistleblowers. In 1956, the former head of Project Blue Book, Edward Ruppelt, would shock the world with the release of his book, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This seminal book detailed his time with Project Blue Book. Still angry about the Robertson panel, Edward Ruppelt was now officially going on the record challenging the Air Force. And upon the book's release, Jonathan Leonard was quick to write a negative review in the New York Times, dismissing Ruppelt and his book. Leonard's article contains language like, The flying saucer cult has split into subcults, as cults have a way of doing. And he accuses Ruppelt of being a liar, stating, The conclusion is negative. Nearly all of the reports were explained on close examination, in unsensational ways. The scientists found no evidence, whatever, that even the few surviving unknowns were likely to have come from space. Ruppelt may have known before his book went to press that this cruel blockbuster was about to be dropped on the saucer cultist. This article was Ruppelt's first time being profiled in the New York Times, and his introduction to many Americans. It didn't matter that Ruppelt had ran the UFO program, and it didn't matter that he had served his country in World War II. 
when he tried to blow the whistle on the UFO cover-up, he was disparaged in the media. The release of Rupeld's book is one of the many gray areas of UFO history. Rupeld's book contradicted many of the official positions taken on UFOs, and it contains some of the first references to the Project Sign estimate of the situation in the Robertson panel, though neither by name. UFO researchers have long debated why the Air Force allowed this book to be released. Some claiming it was accidentally approved by the Air Force, others claiming that it was intentionally approved by the Air Force as it diminished the Air Force role in the cover-up, deferring responsibility to the CIA. But these are topics to be explored in later videos. Nevertheless, Rupelt's sentiment can be best exemplified by the last line of his book. Maybe the Earth is being visited by interplanetary spaceships. Only time will tell. And Edward Rupelt began going around the country and advocating for a serious addressal of the UFO phenomena. Now it wasn't just Donald Kehoe and UFO groups challenging the Air Force, but the man who ran the UFO program. Edward Rupelt would continue his UFO advocacy campaign in 1956, when he teamed up with other disaffected members of Project Blue Book and Hollywood producers to make a film about their experiences with the UFO program, titled Unidentified Flying Objects, The True Story of Flying Saucers. You will see with your own eyes actual motion pictures of flying saucers, scenes that were stamped top secret by the Pentagon. These films have never before been shown to the general press and public. These men are about to see actual motion pictures of flying saucers. You will see them too in unidentified flying objects. I have a separate video where I cover this movie in greater detail. I recommend watching it. It is an excellent behind the scenes look at the early days of Project Blue Book and covers some of the 1952 UFOs over DC. For the first time, unidentified flying objects have been sighted over the nation's capital. For this video, we are covering the Air Force response to this movie. Once the Air Force caught wind that this film was being made, they became very concerned. Linked in the description is the later declassified Blue Book file on the movie, and it details how they feared that this movie would cause society to go into a UFO craze. And in response to this movie's release, the Air Force released a memo preventing any Ground Observer Corps unit in the country from promoting this film. The Ground Observer Corps was a civilian defense organization that consisted of volunteers monitoring the skies for Soviet threats. This was one of the nation's largest civilian organizations, and it was mentioned by name in the CIA's Robertson panel. The Air Force was able to obtain an early copy of the film, and in preparation for the film's release, J. Allen Hynek was called upon to create countermeasures, or official responses to each UFO incident referenced in the film. This bothered Hynek, having to publicly discredit Rupelt and his old colleagues. He liked and respected Rupelt, but Hynek went along with it anyways. He rationed, it was better to be on the inside where he might be able to make a difference. Fortunately for the Air Force, the UFO whistleblower film was not popular, as the American public felt the film was too slow, and the film received a negative review in the New York Times. For the Air Force, a crisis was averted. There is another movie that came out in 1956 that is worth quickly mentioning, Earth vs. the Flying Saucers. Some in the UFO community allege that this film is also a part of the UFO cover-up, though it is not as well documented. Their reasoning is that this movie claims to be based on Donald Kehoe's book, and Kehoe is credited in the opening credits. Donald Kehoe states that he was approached by Hollywood producers to make a movie based on his book. He only agreed if the producers promised to stay true to his book, which they obliged. 
However, when the movie was finally finished, it made no mention of the UFO cover-up, the main theme of Kehoe's books. But even worse, the movie based their flying saucers on the videos by contactee George Adamski, who Kehoe detested. The film's lack of mentioning of the cover-up, and that his book was now associated with Adamski, angered Kehoe so much that he requested his name be removed from the credits. The degree to which these were intentional slights against Kehoe or just the result of the movie-making process is unknown, but it is worth being aware of. These two movies, both inspired by the DC UFO wave, showed the importance of motion film in controlling the UFO narrative, and the Air Force would soon begin disseminating the anti-UFO PSYOP through the newest craze that was sweeping the nation. Yes, sir, if you want real entertainment, the best place to find it is in front of a General Electric Black Daylight Big as Life television set. See me at my best. See me on a Motorola. Sports, comedy, drama, news, music. Yes, they're all yours. A soft frame of light around the screen to reduce that sharp contrast between the brilliant picture and the darker outside. This model has a big 16-inch black rectangular tube that lets you see everything that the camera sees. The 1950s were the decade of the television. In 1950, 20% of American households had a television, and by the end of the decade, that number had jumped to 90%. The mass adoption of televisions by Americans in the 1950s had large impacts on society. Televisions would change how we got our news, usher in American consumerism, change our relationship with sports, with politics, with race, with war, and many other things. This period in the 1950s and 60s, when the relationship between Americans and televisions was forming, coincided with the time when the Air Force's anti-UFO PSYOP was in full swing. The Air Force would use the broadcast company, CBS, to broadcast the anti-UFO PSYOP across this increasingly popular medium. If you will recall from part one of this series, the intelligence agencies had a large influence on CBS during this time. It was entirely in order for our correspondents at that time uh, to make use of uh, CIA agent ch uh, chiefs uh, of station and other members of the executive staff of CIA as sources of information which were useful in their assessments of world conditions. Would you say that continues today? Well, I, yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations of the period of the 1970s, uh, it seems to me that a reporter's got to be much more circumspect in doing it now, or he runs the risk of uh, at least being looked at with considerable disfavor by the public. I think you've got to be much more careful about it. Along with the Sig Mickelson connection, Another CIA-CBS connection can be found in that CIA director Alan Dulles had a close personal friendship with CBS board chairman William Paley. And starting in the 1950s, we see many instances of the Air Force influencing CBS television media, promoting the goals of the Robertson panel to demystify UFOs and make people disinterested. And keep in mind, the men on the ground level enforcing the cover-up felt that they were doing their duty and preventing the Soviet Union from using the UFO issue in some kind of nuclear first strike. A strategy that we see the Air Force employ during this time was to use CBS for damage control following a widely coveraged UFO wave, especially those that they were not able to contain, which had credible witnesses and generated much news coverage. Folks in Level Land, Texas, are worried about strange objects in their neighborhood. Sheriff Weir Clem says he has received several reports of a strange egg-shaped object about 200 feet long landing on farms and highways last night in the vicinity of Level Land. Sheriff Clem says he even himself got a glimpse of the thing which somehow turned off lights and auto engines when it came near. The sheriff says that lights and engines worked fine again after the thing went away. This is Bob Pierpoint in Washington. The Air Force explained the UFO sightings as ball lightning in an electrical storm, and this explanation angered many Texans, and caused inquiries from Texas politicians, including then-Senator Lyndon B. Johnson, who represented the citizens of Leveland. After the Leveland flap and subsequent outcry, 
the Air Force organized a quasi-debate against UFO researchers on the CBS show The Armstrong Circle Theater. This show was advertised as representing both sides of the UFO debate, the believer and the debunker. The pro-UFO side was to consist of Kenneth Arnold, the man whose sightings started the flying saucer craze in 1947, Donald Kehoe, one of the first UFO researchers who is now the head of NICAP, one of the most prominent civilian UFO groups in the country, and the former head of Project Blue Book, Edward Ruppelt. Opposite the pro-UFO crowd was the debunking side, which consisted of Air Force officials Richard Horner and Spencer Whedon, along with trusted scientist Dr. Donald Menzel. I refer to this program as a quasi-debate because the Air Force, citing threats to national security, mandated that they needed to approve each line of script for every guest, even the pro-UFO crowd. Among the things the Air Force strictly forbid mention of were the Project Sign Estimate of the Situation and the Robertson Panel, both of which had been revealed in Repelt's book. And the Air Force also forbid mention of any potential congressional UFO hearings that Kehoe and NICAP were planning behind the scenes. This heavy hand was acknowledged by all involved, and soon, some of the pro-UFO crowd began dropping out. The first to drop out was Edward Ruppelt. He claims that he was unaware of the time requirement needed for filming. It has been alleged by Kehoe and many others, but never proven, that the Air Force pressured Ruppelt's employer to force him to drop out. The next to drop out was Kenneth Arnold. He was angry that the Air Force had surprised everyone with their control and censorship, and Kenneth Arnold released a statement. This is to inform you that I will not be a participant on any program that obviously misrepresents and distorts facts available on any subject. Now, in other words, I know a great deal of demonstrable facts on this subject that were completely ignored. Donald Kehoe is the only pro-UFO representative remaining by the time the show aired and he thought of a way that he could expose the Air Force. And on January 22, 1958, a few months after the Level and Flap, the Armstrong Circle Theater show, UFO, Enigma of the Skies, was broadcast live. Good evening, everybody, coast to coast. This is Douglas Edwards. Tonight, Armstrong Circle Theater goes after a most unusual story, the riddle of the flying saucers. We will depart from our usual format, and instead of dramatizing an adventure, we ask you to participate in a controversy. Are UFO, unidentified flying objects, real or imagined? Of the scores of private, non-government organizations that are devoted to UFO, possibly the most active and eminent, is the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena of Washington, D.C. Its director is Major Donald E. Kehoe, Annapolis graduate and a former Marine Corps pilot, author of Flying Saucers from Outer Space. Donald Kehoe wanted to prove to the American public the reality of the UFO cover-up that the Air Force vehemently denied. He decided to deviate from the pre-approved script, and in response, CBS cut the live feed of the show. And now, Mr. Edwards, I would like to make a disclosure, which is something which has never been revealed to the public. For the last six months, our committee has been working with a Senate committee, which is investigating official secrecy on UFOs. If the hearings are held, open hearings, I feel it will prove beyond doubt that the flying self deserves. In order to ensure the information, we need we suggest that all Thank you, Major Kehoe. One of the most eminent men of science who has taken a deep interest in the problem of UFO is Professor Donald H. Menzel, Professor of Astrophysics and Director of the Observatory at Harvard University and author of Flying Saucers, published by the Harvard University Press. Professor Menzel, in your considered opinion, has our atmosphere been invaded by spaceships, flying objects originating in outer space? No, emphatically no. And I think the Air Force has been put upon in this whole affair. They've had to make their investigation, of course. They're bound by the most serious of considerations, the security of our country. But it's gone far enough. In my opinion, it's not the reports of the flying saucers that should be analyzed. 
It's the non-qualified interpreters themselves who argue that these saucers come from outer space. The show has awkwardly returned to Air Force debunker Donald Menzel and more Air Force officials who repeated the official stance of UFOs being misidentifications and hoaxes. And the show ends with a denial of the cover-up. Now, the Honorable Richard E. Horner, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Research and Development. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. During recent years, there has been a mistaken belief that the Air Force has been hiding from the public information concerning unidentified flying objects. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Armstrong Circle Theater show was supposed to help calm the public, but instead it backfired for the Air Force as the censorship of Donald Kehoe soon became a national scandal. And the CBS director of editing released a statement apologizing and acknowledging the Air Force hand, stating, This program had been carefully cleared for security reasons. Therefore, it was the responsibility of this network to ensure performance in accordance with the predetermined security standards. Project Blue Book personnel now had to do damage control because of the Kehoe censorship scandal. Then Senator Lyndon B. Johnson was among the angry politicians demanding answers. Senator Johnson represented the angry citizens of Leveland, and he also sat on the Armed Services Committee. In the declassified Blue Book files, there is a letter from Lt. Col. Lawrence Tacker to Chairman Lyndon B. Johnson, placing blame on CBS, claiming that the Air Force didn't cut the feed, CBS did, over fears of lawsuits, and denying any allegations of a cover-up by the Air Force. Donald Kehoe is invited on The Mike Wallace Show to discuss the Armstrong censorship. It should be noted that Mike Wallace has a history of being a mouthpiece for the establishment, best exemplified by this anti-homosexual PSA. The Homosexuals with CBS News correspondent Mike Wallace. Homosexuality is an enigma. Even in this era of bold sexual mores, it remains a subject that people find disturbing, embarrassing and the reluctance to discuss it, yet there is a growing concern about homosexuals in society, about their increasing visibility. For what it's worth, in 1992, Mike Wallace said that he regretted making this PSA, and he even said that at the time he had misgivings about it. But this PSA demonstrates his willingness to be a mouthpiece of the establishment on CBS. And when Donald Kehoe went on the Mike Wallace show, he was particularly antagonistic to Kehoe and to UFOs. Major Kehoe, first of all, let me ask you this. Most people in the United States, in spite of the fact that I say that millions do believe, I think you will agree that most people in the United States don't believe in flying saucers from outer space. They probably hold the view of columnist Bob Considine, who wrote that flying saucers are products of, for the most part, quote, pranksters, halfwits, cranks, publicity hounds, fanatics in general, and screwballs, end quote. How do you feel about Mr. Considine's charge? Well, I know where he got the story. He got it from Colonel Watson out at the Air Technical Intelligence Center in Dayton. In fact, the colonel went even a little farther, and he said behind every sighting was an idiot, a crackpot, a religious fanatic. That included a lot of high-ranking Air Force pilots, incidentally, and many airline captains, people who were qualified to see these things. But he's just following out an Air Force policy. I shouldn't say largely, I'll say 99 and 44 one hundredths percent, a hoax. Now, you mentioned... A hoax? Well, that, that, uh, when I say a, a hoax, lot of good pilots hoax. But you mentioned a Dr. Donald Menzel, who's a professor of astrophysics at Harvard before. Now, I think you will agree that he's one of the world's most distinguished. He stresses, you see, that pilots are not expert observers, that they, as well as others, can see flying saucers when it's only, to quote him, the wrapper off somebody's lunch blowing around in the air, end quote. Uh, you mentioned these, did this denial of these documents. Now, I'd like to tell you something that happened on the Armstrong Circle Theater. I had requested that those points be in the script, and I was discouraged from it at first by their writer. Then later, some of our board of governors insisted that we have those points included. So I said, either I don't go on, or we have those in there. I said, all right. So the script was completely rewritten. Now those were in the script as it was first rehearsed, but when the second rehearsal came along, 
and the Air Force saw the mimeograph sheet, the Air Force representative, according to the Armstrong writer, said they would immediately deny it on the air, even though it meant denouncing their own former project chief. Now, the source for this is Captain Edward Ruppel, who was the head of Project Blue Book for two years, and at that time he was considered good enough that he briefed President Truman on this thing. He was the top man. Rank didn't mean anything. It's your experience that counted. All right. He says these things existed. He put it in the book, which was cleared by security and review in the Air Force. On December 5th, 1955, that was cleared. It's in his book. He's never been hauled in and court-martialed. Now, I have here, and if you allow your camera to come in on it, this is a sheet from the script of the Armstrong Theater, which was deleted. This was crossed off, and I was told that I couldn't say it on the air. Now, that was censorship by intimidation. This can be matched up with the other sheets from the Armstrong Circle script, and any typewriter expert will show you. Well, I'm certain, certain that, I'm certain They ordered that, it taken out. I'm certain that people believe you. The only thing is that the next morning, I distinctly remember reading a report by you, Major Keogh, to the effect that no censorship, no pressure of any kind had been put no, up on you. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Walsh. The, that, I know that statement almost by heart. Yes. I said that CBS and the Armstrong uh, people were not to blame for cutting me off the air when I tried to mention the fact that a Senate committee was working on the secrecy angle. I never mentioned this that night to anyone because I had promised that I wouldn't say anything about it on the air, that, uh, the, the Armstrong people. It was taken out, and I will do this. I will ask the United States Air Force to have the Marine Corps put me on active duty for court-martial if that is not the case the names because they were too high. One of them is a top scientist in this country whose name would be known to everybody. Well, why wouldn't he want his... Because he's afraid of the official ridicule. He's afraid of official ridicule? That's right. More afraid of official ridicule than of possibly uh, alerting the country to a serious You'd national danger? You'd be surprised danger? how many people give us reports and they say, please keep my name confidential. I think the American people should write to their congressman and insist that open hearings be held by the Senate Committee on permanent on the Permanent Committee on Government Operations, which has been looking into this for six months. An Air Force I, spokesman told us this last week. He said members of the Se of the Senate subcommittee have talked with us already, and they have shown no interest in conducting any hearings on this issue. I talked with the chief investigator within the last two weeks. I gave him a lot of information, and I gave him data on one case where an airliner was sent to chase one of these things, and, they, and the passengers kept in ignorance of it at that time. That involves two government agencies beside the Air Force, which has re refused to release the report. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this. If you were to get, if, they, if the committee were to get Ruppelt, Major Fournay, several colonels around that time, Major General Garland, who was on the project, there would be a big revelation because the Air Force is simply treating the American people like children. They don't trust them with the facts. And this is how Mike Wallace closed the interview about clear-cut censorship. But you yourself have never seen a flying system. I've just been a reporter and a careful one. Thank you very much, Major Donald Kehoe. As you've just heard, the flying saucer controversy is deadlocked in contradictory statements and interpretation of facts. As for Major Donald Kehoe himself, like most of us, he's never seen a flying saucer, which may just make him like a mystic who's never seen a ghost. But one must give him credit. He has much faith. In a moment, I'll bring you a rundown on next week's guest, one of the giants of the entertainment business. It should be noted that at the time of the interview, Kehoe and NICAP were in talks with elected officials about UFO hearings. But ultimately, the Air Force was able to thwart those efforts and keep the politicians at bay. The Air Force also got involved with scripted television to spread the anti-UFO PSYOP. Steve Canyon was a TV show about an Air Force aviator in 1958. This show was based on the comics by Milton Cantiff, and Steve Canyon was kind of like a James Bond type character for the Air Force. For the single season it ran, it was the most expensive show on television, largely because the Air Force supplied millions of dollars worth of planes. This gave the Air Force major influence on the episode scripts, usually changing a few lines here and there for each episode. Steve Canyon served the useful purpose of displaying American air superiority to foreign enemies, and a big toy campaign was launched to get the youth interested in enlisting. 
This show is textbook military propaganda. In 1959, the Steve Canyon screenwriters wanted to do an episode titled Project UFO that left the implication that UFOs were otherworldly. The Air Force strictly forbid this and removed any implications that UFOs were non-human and removed any lines critical of the Air Force's handling of the UFO issue. The plot was then restructured to be in accordance with the recommendations of the Robertson panel, which if you will recall, stated, the UFO debunking campaign could be accomplished by mass media such as television, motion pictures, and popular articles. Basis of such education would be actual case histories which had been puzzling at first, but later explained. As in the case of conjuring tricks, there is much less stimulation if the secret is known. And we can see this plot structure of puzzling at first and later explained in the final cut of the episode. The main character, Steve Canyon, is assigned to investigate UFOs that at first seem quite anomalous. Okay, yeah. Is that all you have to say? How come the people in town saw something when no one here at the airfield was aware of it? it didn't show up on the radar. It was too high or too small or too something. When were the pictures taken? Five days ago. You sent the negatives to Dayton? Of course. Well, what was the report? There's been no report yet. Every time I ask technical intelligence what's holding it up, they tell me, oh, it's a tough one. They can't figure it out yet. Could it be the McCoy, Jay? What do you mean? Could those things really be flying saucers? Now, look, for the love of Pete, don't you start giving me the business. I've got a whole town on my You've hands. You've got a I... whole town? All right. We. We've got a whole town on our hands, believing those things to be flying saucers. Now, let's not have the Air Force getting wacky, too. He then investigates and stumbles upon a UFO researcher speaking event. Ah, November 3rd. Fiery object seen over American Air Base in Japan. November 4th. Two rose-colored saucers seen over India. November 5th. Radar picks up unidentified flying objects over the English Channel. Steve listens and even grows a liking to the female ufologist. Over the course of the episode, Steve Canyon grows more and more perplexed and confused as to what the UFOs could be, before it is ultimately revealed what the UFOs are. This was picked up in a plowed field 18 miles east of town. Gunnison's farm. Gunnison's kid picked it up and brought it in. When? One hour ago. <laughs> It's so primitive, it's clever. We reinflated this balloon so that you could see. Actually, it blows up to about six foot in diameter. A piece of magnesium just big enough to bother the radar scope. All right, now the pattern's beginning to shape up. The first was perfectly legitimate sightings. The local citizens saw something up there that looked like saucers. Okay, so they weren't saucers. We know that now. They were merely weather balloons. But it's profitable for somebody to keep the people excited. So they're sending those things up. It's profitable, all right. That's the word. Profitable for Amanda Crown. She must be working with an accomplice. We find the accomplice and we'll find the evidence. Any ideas? All the fuss was the result of elaborate weather balloon hoaxes by scummy UFO researchers to make money. The theme the Air Force wanted the audience to internalize. Accessory to what? To this. Well, who is this man? Oh, you, you're that rude reporter from the Kansas City Bulletin. That's what he says. What crime is this man charged with? Interfering with a defense effort. Malicious mischief, to name only two. Oh, well, that's not very serious, is it? Well, the most he could get for that is six months. Now, wait a minute. That's not so terribly long, is it? Now, wait a minute. All right, you. This is the woman that you've been working with, isn't it? Never saw her before in my life. I still ask the question, why do you do it? What kind of a life is it for a woman like you? <laughs> it's a living. See you around, Colonel. To further illustrate the Air Force involvement in the Steve Canyon UFO episode, let's listen to Milton Estate producer John Ellis and aviation historian James H. Farmer from the 2008 DVD commentary. This was an episode that the Air Force did not really want to be aired. The the script went through a lot of changes and evolution and this is pretty tame, this final script compared to the earlier renditions um, and uh, they go right back to the Roswell um, canard of, of claiming that the UFO was actually a weather balloon 
which should be a, a safe escape for the Air Force. Um, but this was causing them a lot of uh, public relations problems. I mean, from Roswell in 47 to the UFO overflights over Washington, D.C. in 52, Project Blue Book. The Air Force wanted nothing to do with it. It was a hot potato. Now, you know, I've given you copies of the scripts, uh, but uh, the thing that's interesting is uh, that when you look at the original scripts and not a copy, uh, you know, they always have uh, uh, different colored pages in them. For the changes. For the changes, uh, depending on the revision. And uh, I will tell you that the only, that, that uh, Project UFO is the only script that had no white pages in it. It was all colored pages, and that was because every single page got rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. That was because um, because of uh, Air Force intervention. In 1960, the Air Force received some assistance in controlling the UFO narrative when Edward Ruppelt, the former head of Project Blue Book, re-released his book, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects, with three additional chapters. To the surprise of many, these three additional chapters were a complete reversal of his mood from the original release, where the original release was agnostic and open to otherworldly explanations for UFOs. The re-release included three additional chapters that took a harsh, skeptical turn. This is best exemplified by comparing the final line of both releases. Ruppelt's original 1956 ending reads, Maybe the Earth is being visited by interplanetary spaceships. Only time will tell. And the final line of the 1960 re-release reads, No responsible scientist will argue with the fact that other solar systems may be inhabited and that someday we may meet those people, but it hasn't happened yet, and until that day comes, we're stuck with our space-age myth the UFO. The reasons why Ruppelt re-released his book and did a complete 180 on his stance on UFOs have long been debated. Some allege that it was because he had grown disgusted by George Adamski and the contactee movement. His own wife would say it was because Ruppelt felt horribly about the allegations of a cover-up levied against the Air Force, an institution he still respected. And some allege that he was forced to by the Air Force. As evidence of malfeasance, they highlight that the re-release of the book was printed with the original 1956 copyright note, and there is no mention that it was a re-release. We would never know the reasons why Ruppelt changed his opinion, as he would die of a heart attack a few months after the re-release of his book. He was 37 years old. With Ruppelt's death, one of the main threats to the anti-UFO narrative in the country was gone, and the anti-UFO PSYOP would continue. In the early 1960s, various Blue Book personnel could be found on televisions promoting the goals of the Robertson panel. Major Hector Quintanella, Wright Patterson Field, Chief of Project Blue Book, the unit that investigates UFOs. After almost 20 years and after having investigated over 9,000 cases, the Air Force has determined that the UFO phenomenon does not present a threat to the national security of the United States. Only one of these men is the real J. Allen Hynek. The other two are imposters and will try to fool this panel. And I can't say and won't say that I have solved it or know the answer, yet a simple calculation shows that the setting moon was in virtually precisely the position of the sighting of the glow that Mrs. Crowley reported. In over 9,000 cases on file in the Air Force, there is no indication that craft, so-called craft, have been guided by any form of intelligence. Has anybody been uh, hurt, injured, or touched any of these uh, unidentified flying objects in the air, on the ground? To the best of my knowledge, no. Now, just off the cuff, just between you and me, do you think there's any of them little greenies in the, in the egg-shaped things? Or, I won't tell the Air Force. <laughs> I don't have any information that there are, no. Number two, do you know who Gerald Hurd is? What? Yes, he is a um, science fiction writer, I believe. And... The Air Force has been accused from time to time of hiding information about UFO. What do you have to say to that kind of thing? These charges are absolutely untrue. 
There's nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide at all. It would be almost preposterous to try to ascribe to the moon the erratic motions of the object as described and reported by Officer Joe Lukasak. Other countries place a burden of proof on the observer, and not on the earth. And that would make your job a lot easier if they did that. Yes, yes it would. Which one do you think is the real one? I voted for number two because I think Long John Neville has a show. Well, I voted for number two. I think they were all absolutely remarkable, but... The astronomer and Air Force consultant on unidentified flying objects. Therefore, will the real Dr. J. Allen Hynek please stand up. The UFO situation was relatively calm and being managed in the early 1960s. But then, in 1966, there would be one of the biggest and most consequential UFO waves the Air Force would face. Here in Michigan, Washtenaw County authorities this morning are taking a close look at last night's flurry of reports of flying saucer activity northwest of Ann Arbor. Several residents and police officers in the Ann Arbor area reported spotting mysterious aircraft, the third report in a week. I'm Sheriff Douglas Harvey. We had uh, several cars dispatched out there, and uh, they described it as the same thing as we even had, the uh, same kind of optics uh, a week ago. The bright lights, the bluish green lights, and so on. Uh, maneuverability from side to side, up and down. The Sheriff Douglas Harvey, who had this to say about the UFOs. Uh, I, I have not myself seen it, but the fact remains now we've got too many people, too many trained people that have spotted this thing and give us the same identical description. This UFO flap had many witnesses and generated much press. The Air Force needed the Michigan UFO wave to go away. Dr. J. Allen Hynek was sent to Michigan to investigate the UFO sightings and to calm the public. The Air Force demanded that Hynek quickly come up with an explanation. He had no explanation and needed time, but they didn't care. With no time to spare, Hynek would come up with an explanation that would live in infamy. That uh, I emphasize in conclusion that I cannot prove in a court of law that marsh gas is the full explanation of these sightings. But it does appear to me extremely likely. Well, doctor, isn't it the nature of swamp gas to remain close to the ground, and especially during a thunderstorm, wouldn't that keep it down? Some of these witnesses have told us that they've seen it uh, hundreds of yards in the sky. Well, some, one or two witnesses did say that, but the great majority, again, you must remember that I've sifted down all the many, many reports. I've been talking to these people day after day. Uh, <laughs> You cannot simply take every statement made and give it credence. You have to, to get the least common denominator of these statements. Right, doctor, is there a possibility that flying saucers do exist, though? Uh, it depends on how you define this now. What do you mean by a flying saucer? An unidentified object from outer space? I think that's the popular conception. That would be the popular conception. I have no, certainly I have no scientific evidence this is so. And I would I would be delighted to have some, really, if, if I could. Uh, it would just think how exciting it would make things. This explanation angered many in the area and caused Dr. J. Allen Hynek to become a national laughingstock. More and more people were doubting the Air Force UFO investigations, including the local congressman Gerald Ford, another future president in the Blue Book Files. The prominent congressman from Michigan thinks there should be a further investigation of the strange UFO reports. House Minority Leader Gerald Ford said this today. The Congress should investigate the rash of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects in southern Michigan and other parts of the country. A congressional inquiry would be most worthwhile because the American people are becoming most interested and in many instances very alarmed by the UFO story. I firmly believe the American people would feel much better if there was a full-blown investigation of these alleged incidents. Congressman Gerald Ford. The Michigan UFO flap resulted in UFO coverage not seen since 1952. New stories were everywhere. A few scattered scientists were beginning to question the Air Force. 
and Congress was planning real political action on the UFO issue. To help quell the public, the Air Force would return to Old Faithful, CBS, and produce the documentary UFOs, Friend, Foe, or Fantasy, hosted by Walter Cronkite. It should be noted Walter Cronkite has intelligence connections, as his name did come up during the church committee hearings, and more about that can be read in the description. Though unknown to the public at the time, the CIA and Air Force had creative control for this documentary. Thornton Page, a scientist and original member of the CIA's Robertson panel back in 1952, worked on this documentary. Dr. Thorin Page wrote a memo to his CIA associate, Kevin Durant, that he helped organize the CBS TV show around the Robertson panel conclusions. According to J. Allen Hynek, the head of Project Blue Book, Hector Quintanilla, spent three days censoring the script to conform with the Robertson panel's recommendations. And Palmer Williams, an executive producer of CBS, would later say that CBS worked with the Department of Defense and their intent was to knock the UFO story down. And Palmer Williams would also say he had worked with the Air Force on multiple projects before, but they approached the UFO subject in a weird and off-the-books manner he had yet to encounter. In five weeks after the Michigan wave, the documentary UFO, Friend, Foe, or Fantasy was broadcast to millions of Americans. CBS reports UFO, Friend, Foe, or Fantasy, reported by CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good evening. Reports of flying saucers are nothing new. From the beginning of recorded time, men have been seeing unexplainable things in the sky. And there's no reason to doubt they saw something. The question is, was what they saw really there? And what was it they really saw? Some of the criticisms lobbied against this documentary at the time by NICAP were that CBS interviewed two kinds of people, uniformed, well-spoken people who did not believe in UFOs. Our critics continually charged that the United States Air Force is withholding information from the general public on this subject. This is absolutely untrue. We are not hiding anything. We have nothing to hide. And that most of what we're dealing with in these reports is almost certainly fantasy. Has there ever been a report of a flying saucer, Captain, that was translated into hard information right here? A plot on the board in this room? I don't think so, Bill for the reason that these sightings have never been substantiated and could not be translated into hard radar return figures. And NICAP highlighted that the people CBS chose to interview, who do believe in UFOs, were contactees who were not well spoken. Howard, would you tell us in your own words about your trip to Venus, how it started? Well, as I say, it started first with a very decided tingling all over my body. Uh, this tingling uh, finally extended to the mind area, and there was a clarification of mind such as, uh, it's hard to believe, I seem to become one with the entire universe. Mrs. Madeline Rodifer, who has made her own UFO film, and who credits Adamski with an assist in her first contact with Venusians. Some of them have even been to our home. And the day that the one came into to the yard, which I filmed on the camera, there were three inside the ship. NICAP would highlight that many military personnel, commercial pilots, and law enforcement officers have reported sightings, and none of these people were featured in the pro-UFO side. NICAP was also critical of the supposed UFO footage used in the documentary. In this documentary, CBS showcased two examples of supposed UFO footage that UFO believers were touting. The first was the questionable UFO footage from the contactee girl. Then CBS used a proven prosaic film, the Odal tape. They first showcased the UFO believer presenting this film as the best example of UFOs. They then exposed the alleged UFOs for its prosaic explanation. Uh, it is nothing conventional, it is nothing unconventional aerodynamically. There's no single piece of earth-born equipment of any kind that can look and behave like that. The old fields indeed had not faked anything, but the UFO in their film soon proved explainable. A few days later, an enterprising BBC cameraman took a similar camera, sat in the same seat, and filmed the same English countryside. The same UFO hovered into view, went through the same maneuvers and disappeared into itself the same way. The UFO turned out to be the reflection of the tail section of the plane itself. 
And for the Michigan case, which caused the documentary to be made, none of the law enforcement officer witnesses were interviewed, and CBS made no criticism of the Air Force marsh gas explanations. Though the public was unaware, NICAP was right in their assessment that this documentary was a government op. Thirteen years after the Robertson panel, we can still see its influence in this documentary. We see Dr. Donald Menzel. Many people looking up into the sky can see a bright object on the horizon. They think that this object is a UFO, when actually we get an effect which uh, we call a mirage. We see Dr. Thornton Page, an original member of the Robertson panel, appear alongside the next generation's face of UFO skepticism, Carl Sagan. Astronomer Thornton Page was on a CIA committee that investigated UFO reports in 1952. Its conclusion? No evidence of UFOs. Our panel was expected to be, and I think was, uh, objective in its approach and tried to um, evaluate all the reports uh, without saying they're ridiculous in advance. That uh, has been repeated quite recently, uh, and that is a good reason for uh, talking with Carl Sagan here because uh, he's in the same position that I was, being the only astronomer in a similar panel. If you would believe, as, uh, as the flying saucer cultists would have us believe, that uh, the, the majority of the saucer reports are due to visitations, then you have a very strange situation. We see an extended section on George Adamski and the contactees. Perhaps the farthest out group is made up of the contactees. They have met talked to, or even ridden with visitors from outer space. The late George Adamski is regarded by his followers as something of a Christopher Columbus among outer space voyagers. If you want to get really conspiracy-brained, notice how they have Kehoe's books in the middle of the Adamski section, and the word contactee is spoken right as his books are shown. The farthest out group is made up of the contactees. We see the Avro car. A real flying saucer looks like this. An Avro car, manufactured in Canada, being test flown in 1961. We see an extended section on hoaxers. The hoaxes, however, are easy to explain. The finders said this was food from outer space. The Food and Drug Administration analyzed it as old-fashioned buckwheat cakes. We see Dr. Hynek. Although it should be noted, Hynek was still angry with the Air Force. Hynek's personal issues with the cover-up were mounting, and he felt like the Air Force used him as a patsy for the swamp gas debunk, left him out to dry. He was tired of lying to the public, and you can see the conflict in him. You might call me a study in puzzlement, but um, uh, that among the tremendous noise or static or crud or whatever you want to call it, a tremendous number of unreliable reports that are easily explained, there is this residue of most interesting cases that intrigue me in the same way that a good mystery story intrigues me. And I'd like to get the solution. I don't think it is space people, although I would be delighted if it, if it turned out that way. Because as an astronomer, I think it would make astronomy even more interesting than it is. But how do you answer the people who are pretty competent, careful, cautious, probing people, pilots, radar trackers, those are particularly the people that I like to talk to because they have, they understand what angular rates are, they understand scientific terminology. I can ask them what was the altitude and azimuth when you first saw it, what was its azimuth and altitude when it disappeared, uh, what, was its, what was its angular acceleration. They can give you an intelligent answer to things like that. What, what is your answer to the people who uh, are sure there are spaceships and they say that you and the Air Force are in cahoots? Well, first of all, this business about being in cahoots is just simply a downright falsehood. And if they insist that space vehicles exist, I say, oh, fine, the burden of proof is on you. In this video, we covered how the anti-UFO PSYOP was propagated through the New York Times and CBS. There is a clear change in New York Times coverage following the Robertson panel. Skeptic debunking stories were promoted, and cases with credible witnesses were suppressed. And this trend was observed across most newspapers in the country. We also saw the Air Force influence the rapidly developing landscape of TVs. 
There are many clear-cut examples over multiple years of scripts and media being censored and manipulated to influence public opinion, especially following a large UFO flap with many credible witnesses. This coordinated propaganda campaign, occurring as the American relationship with television was developing, proved quite effective and caused many Americans to dismiss UFOs during the 1950s and 1960s. And as more channels were created giving the Air Force less control, the foundations set by the anti-UFO PSYOP during this crucial period played a major role in cultivating the culture of stigma and ridicule that persists through today. It should be noted that these were some of the more clear-cut examples of manipulation, but there is still a lot that we don't know. Unfortunately for the Air Force, the Michigan UFO flap and subsequent interest from Congress caused the UFO issue to once again become too big to brush aside. For now, we will close with this. A clip from the 1966 CBS documentary UFO, Friend, Foe, or Fantasy about the first man to report the Michigan UFOs, Frank Mannard. Upon first watch, it is sad, as his life was ruined because of the UFO stigma. But when you consider that this whole documentary was made in accordance with the Air Force and the CIA, it takes on a different role. Beyond witnessing the results of the stigma, this clip can be seen as a threat of what will happen to you and how you will be perceived if you report a UFO. Frank Manor, the Michigan farmer who had brought in the first report, was caught in the middle. He was mad. Well, you can look at here, look, beer bottles thrown. Look at my windshield. What would you think if somebody was throwing beer bottles at your house, standing out in the middle of the road screaming, uh, you nut, you're fanatic and all that? What would you think? Are you sorry now that you did tell people what you saw? Yes, I am. I am, I am sorry because uh, it, it, not that, that it, it's not the truth, but it's just the idea, the, the reaction of the people. They think you're a nut. Tell you the truth, that's just what they figure you are. And I'm not going to take it no more. I don't want nobody down in here. I, I just leave me alone. And if, it, and if the thing lands right there, and right there by that pump, I'd never say a word. Then he got out and talked to me. I wouldn't tell nobody. That's just the way I feel. I'm bitter and, and disgusted in the whole matter. And uh, if, if people's going to act like that, I hope one lands right in Ann Arbor, right in the middle of Detroit.